All right, guys, we're going to jump into it, and uh, I'd love for you to join me. We're going to start in John, John chapter 3. If you were with us last night, I was talking a bit about John 3.16, may we never forget it, may we never grow familiar with it, whether we've heard it once or a thousand times, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world. I was praying over someone last night and my prayer was that they would learn to live loved. I think much of Christianity is about learning to live loved. Learning that before you do anything for God, before you earn anything for God, it's all about realizing that you're actually more loved than you could ever dare imagine. I dare you to live loved. I dare you to believe how much the Father loves you. Jesus, when he's praying in John 17, he says, you have loved me. He's speaking to the Father. You have loved me with an everlasting love. God has loved you with an everlasting love before the foundations of the earth. An ancient love, not just a modern love, but an ancient love. So we talked about John 3, 16, but this passage of scripture that I'm gonna read out happens right before it. There's a man named Nicodemus, and I love this because he is a smart man. He is an intelligent man. He's an incredible man. He is a teacher of Israel. And out of fear of what people are gonna think, he actually comes to Jesus at nighttime, comes to Jesus in privacy, and he begins to ask Jesus questions. He begins to ask, he says, clearly God is with you. Clearly God has anointed you. And so he begins to ask questions of Jesus. And I love this because Jesus begins to speak about the necessity of being born again. When people received Jesus last night, guess what? You were born again. Born not of the flesh, not not born of the will of man, but born of God. That is the privilege that we get as believers when we accept Jesus into our lives. We are born again, born from heaven. Okay, here we go. That's enough context for you guys. John 3, verse five. I love this. Jesus answers Nicodemus and he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Everybody say born of the Spirit. Everyone say wind of God. The word pneuma here in the scriptures can be translated spirit, It can be translated breath, and it can also be translated wind. How many of you guys like standing in the wind? Give me a a wave if you enjoy the wind, like you love it when it's a windy day, you love standing in front of a fan. In Nashville, Tennessee, we have a lot of tornadoes, so I don't like it when it's that windy, but I do like, yeah, right? I'm, I'm not a fan of tornadoes, don't give me a tornado, but I love that feeling of standing in the wind. Anyone with me tonight? There's like seven of you, there's gotta be more that actually just enjoy wind in the face, hair just blowing, man, come on. My hair's out tonight, I'm just, my hat's off, I'm just going for it tonight. I need need a fan for my Beyonce illustration right now, come on. But the only thing that sucks about being out in the wind is when you're wearing a hat, right? Because when you're wearing a hat, next moment, it's like the hat has a mind of its own, right? It's like the hat that you are wearing has a will of its own. It's like Toy Story where the toys just wanna escape, you know what I mean? And so the hat has a mind of its own and it blows off and it starts to run away. And how many of you guys have ever chased your hat down the street? Can I get a show of hands? Yes. And you guys are like me. I mean, I'm a youth pastor. You know, I'm trying to be cool. I'm trying to keep my cool. But the reality is that I really love the hat that has blown off my head. So I'm kind of doing a bit of a walk like this. You know what I mean? Like I'm just 
I'm not, I'm not like desperate, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't really mind if the hat goes, so I'm just gonna lean in, <laughs> stop, please stop, stop, stop. And the hat stops for a moment, then it goes again, then it stops for a moment, then it goes again. And you're thinking, how on earth did we just travel a kilometer, right? Like before you even find the hat, I love the stop, start nature, the unpredictability that happens when it comes to the wind blowing. I wanna tell you tonight that the Christian life is not boring. The Christian life is not dull, it's dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. It's not dull, it's dangerous. And it's got a wildness about it that sometimes makes us uncomfortable. The Christian life lived the way that God wants us to live it is almost like a hat in the wind. The question is not whether or not the wind is blowing. The question is whether or not you are willing to surrender to the wind. Are you willing to allow the wind of God to take you wherever you want the wind to go, wherever the wind wants you to go? Do you hear what I'm saying? I wanna be clear, I love what Wanga was saying tonight, that when it comes to the Holy Spirit, you need to understand my, one of my pastors, Pastor Paul, always says this, there are so many visuals in Scripture, so many dis- depictions of the Holy Spirit, like a dove, like a fire, like a wind, like a river. What do they all have in common? It's movement. But make no mistake, the Holy Spirit is always moving, but the Holy Spirit is not inanimate. The Holy Spirit is a person, the person of the Holy Spirit. May tonight we encounter the person of the Holy Spirit. The title of my message is simple, just like it was last night, and that is Surrender to the Wind. One of my best friends in Nashville, Tennessee, he's a full-time songwriter, and he wrote this beautiful song with a few others. It's called Surrendered. And in the first line of this song called Surrendered, it goes like this, I'm surrendered to the wind of your spirit with my heart in my hands. And then it goes on to say this, I go where you go. Wherever the wind goes, there goes the hat, right? Wherever the wind blows, wherever the Holy Spirit leads, wherever the Holy Spirit goes, that's where I want to go. When he was writing this song, it was the visual of a tree with leaves falling. The moment the leaf falls, it's not like the leaf chooses the direction. I'm gonna go north, south, east, or west. The leaf just goes wherever the wind blows. And I've dedicated my life to preaching to a generation to let you know that the wind of the Holy Spirit is faithful and trustworthy and you can relinquish control. You don't have to worry about a thing because His future is in your hands. You don't have to worry about where you're going because I'm telling you where God is taking every single one of you, if you would surrender to the wind, is a place of glory, a place of greatness, and a place of kingdom impact, and a place of life in Jesus' name. To surrender to the wind. Like it says in Galatians, I wanna walk in step with the Holy Spirit. I'm not the captain of my soul. I'm not the master of my faith. fate. Would you guys turn with me to Genesis, I mean Exodus chapter 31. Here we go. I'm telling you, the wind is blowing in Johannesburg. There is a life of adventure. There is a life of faith. There is a life of risk. I believe that tonight God is authoring faith in the hearts of the next generation. Exodus chapter 31. If I can find it myself, here it is. I love this because this is the second instance in the scriptures that describe a man, a person, being filled with the Holy Spirit. But this is probably the first instance where there is a real direct moment where God fills someone with His Holy Spirit. The first talks about Joseph, talks about how Joseph is, is, a, is a man filled with the Spirit of God. But here we have an artisan. Here we have an artist. Here we have an architect that is about to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you ready for this? Exodus chapter 31, I love this so much. much. Verse one, it says this. The Lord said to Moses, see, I have called by name. Everyone say, "Called called by name. I have called by name 
Betzalel. Everyone say Betzalel. I wish someone did that with me when it came to Zulu and Afrikaans. Just take your time. Every, Josh, Josh, say donkey. <laughs> you know what I mean? Did I say that wrong as well? Okay, anyways. I have called by name Betzalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have, listened to this, filled him, that word ruach, Hebrew word, much like pneuma, breath, wind, spirit. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. Some people think that the only people filled with the Holy Spirit are pastors. The only people filled with the Holy Spirit are ministers. Right now we have a craftsman being filled with the Holy Spirit. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach, come on, working on my pronunciation here, of the tribe of Dan. And I've given to all able men, so now it expands. It's not just two people, but to all able men ability that they may make all that I've commanded you. Okay, bear with me, okay? Sometimes we get a little bored when it comes to lists, but this is amazing. This is what they have been equipped to do by the Spirit of God. The tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony, no big deal. And the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils and the pure lampstand with all its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons for their service as priests and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. Originally, I didn't have that little chunk in my sermon notes tonight. But I, I, I wanted you to see just the detail, that God is a God of detail, that God is a God of specificity. And I also wanted you to see what God entrusted the craftsmen with. Building the tabernacle, building the dwelling place for God, where God Himself was going to dwell. Did you notice I mentioned an altar for burnt offering? Last night we were talking about an altar. These craftsmen were equipped and filled with the Spirit of God and entrusted with that specific kingdom work. The Bible says that God looked at Bezalel and He filled him with His Spirit. I believe that tonight God wants to impart something. I believe that tonight there are teenagers and God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Not half, not a little bit, but fill you to overflow with the Holy Spirit who is a person. So listen to this. The Bible starts with this. God comes to Moses and God says, I have called Bezalel by name. Did you know that he hasn't just called Bezalel by name, but he has called you by name? Many of you guys in this room, I guarantee it, you feel inadequate and you feel like surely God would call that person and that person and that talented person. But I don't know if I can believe that God is calling me. I wanna tell you tonight that God is calling you. God has called you by name. Other people might not know your name. You might feel anonymous in your town. You might feel anonymous in your city. You might feel anonymous in your school, but can I tell you, you are somebody to God. You are somebody so precious to God and He has fashioned you and He has formed you and I'm telling you, He has called you by name. I have a phone number. Who? Give me a wave if you have a phone number. I've got a phone number where you can actually reach me. It gets a little complicated, USA to South Africa. But I have a area code that is actually in Texas. And uh, the reason behind that is because we're all on Kayla's parents' family plan. It's cheaper that way, you know. And so we're all on the family plan. So I have a Texas phone number. If you're wondering, if you have my number and you're wondering about the 281, it's because I have a Texas phone number, even though I live in Nashville, Tennessee. 
This is the problem. I want to vent a little bit tonight. Is that okay? This is the problem with my text and phone number. My text and phone number happens to be basically identical to a car insurance company's phone number called State Farm. I don't know if you've heard of State Farm, but State Farm in Texas somehow has a number that is basically identical to my number. You might be sitting in this room thinking, why is that a big deal? It doesn't matter, that's okay. The reason it's a big deal is because every single day of my life, (laughs) I get many, many calls from Texas. Many, many calls from Texas. And I've made the mistake in moments of answering those calls. And you'd think it would be okay if these calls were just, hey, I need car insurance. That's awesome. We all need car insurance. I'll take that call all day, every day. I'll be an ambassador. I'll be an ambassador for State Farm. I'll recommend it. It's a great car insurance company. This is the problem though. I'm not getting these nice, friendly calls. I want car insurance. I'm getting calls from the side of the road, the scene of the accident. There has just been a wreck and I'm getting these desperate phone calls from people saying, I need my coverage now. And I'm thinking, I'm not State Farm. I don't have the answers. I'm not a mechanic. I don't work for State Farm Insurance. And so I try to ignore the phone calls and I get voicemails. And the thing is, God has, God has equipped me to be a pastor. And so I listen to these voicemails of desperation and I can't just, the conviction of the Holy Spirit hits me, you know? I can't just be like, whatever, man, they'll find it. I'm like, I gotta call them back and tell them, I'm not State Farm. Like you didn't, you didn't, re- re- you didn't reach the right person. But listen to me, I'm taking these phone calls and I'm going, man, I have no idea what to do. I'm not skilled, I'm not equipped, I don't have the ability to actually help you. And so many times as Christians, so many times as teenagers, you receive a call from God and your response to God is inadequacy. Your response to God is that's too big for me. Your response to God is that's too hard for me. Your response to God is all of the what ifs. I I think Linda preached about this recently, all about the limitations, all about the things that you cannot do. But I'm here to tell you tonight that if God calls you and God is calling you, if God calls you, then He will equip you with absolutely everything that you need to do His will. God is not just the God who calls you by name, but God is the God who equips you with absolutely everything that you need to fulfill the purposes of God over your life. You might be in this room tonight and you're just like, I feel the call of God. I feel the pull of God. But man, the wind is blowing in a direction that feels absolutely impossible. And I wanna tell you tonight, that's the point. That's the point. I remember early on in my pastoring days, when it came to preaching, I said to someone, I feel so inadequate. I was hoping to get past it a little bit, you know? She said to me, good. She said, good, I'm glad you feel that way because now there's room for dependence on God. There's room for dependence on the Holy Spirit. And I just wanna encourage some teenagers in the room tonight that you don't have to worry about whether or not you're gonna be good enough when it comes to surrendering to the wind. Your job is to surrender to the wind. Your job is to allow God to fill you with His Spirit, allow God to call you by name, and then allow God to give you everything that you need to fulfill what He's asking you to do. Are you with me tonight? So He goes to Bezalel, who doesn't have the ability and he fills Bezalel with his spirit and then comes what? Gifts of craftsmanship. I love this, I love that Bezalel was a creative. We're gonna pray for this in a moment, but I believe that there is an anointing for creativity, not just on you in this room and Rise Conference, but it's spilling out in Johannesburg. I believe that there is a creative anointing here in Johannesburg, but I also believe that tonight's gonna be a significant night for some of you artists, because I believe that God wants to fill you with His Spirit. Because this is the thing, 
and listen to me very carefully. The world does not need more skilled teenagers. The world needs spirit-filled teenagers. The world doesn't just need teenagers who depend on their gift. The world needs and Johannesburg needs teenagers that will depend on the power and the Spirit of God. The one who supplies all you need. The one who supplies all of your gifts. I love that inside of Bezalel was birthed something fresh. And that is ability to work with gold and silver and, and, and these really specific things. And I just wanna tell you because I believe there's one or two of you in this room and you've bought into the lie that there is no gift in you, that there is no skill in you. And I break that lie in the name of Jesus. Because this is what it says in Philippians 2.13, that God works in you longings and desires and abilities to fulfill His will. I'm here to tell you that there is something in you, that there is more in you than you think there is. There are passions, there are giftings, there are abilities, but more than we pursue those, more than we put identity in those, we find ourselves surrendering to the wind. I need the Holy Spirit. I'm dependent on God. Listen to this, listen to this. Do you know what Bezalel's name means? Bezalel's name means in the shadow of God in the shadow of God. You see what happens is we can have a gift and then we think that the spotlight should be on us and not on God. We have a gift and we, we, we begin to get a little puffed up, not of the spirit, but our own ego, right? I think it's no coincidence that God looks at a man, He searches the earth and He sees a man whose very name means in the shadow of God a man who is humble, a man who is dependent. And God says, that's a man, that's a son that I wanna entrust with incredible things. That's a son that I wanna entrust with gifts and talents and abilities because I trust that he's gonna recognize every step of the way that this is ultimately about God, that this is ultimately about God's glory, that God is not in my shadow, but I'm in the shadow of God. God in Jesus' name. Are you with me? Are you with me tonight, guys? The shadow of God. But here's the thing I love that when it comes to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it's not just for no reason, right? When you read the text, it's not just like, and then God called Bezalel by name and filled him with the Holy Spirit and then walked away and said, awesome right? No, 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 no. There was a specific purpose. There was a specific kingdom work. And I want to tell you that God wants to fill you with His Spirit. God wants to equip you with all sorts of gifts and talents, not so that you would be selfish with it, but so that you would serve a family, serve a city, serve a nation and change the world. God ultimately wants, I love, I love the faith of this conference, that we can actually, that the teenagers in this room can actually shift and change culture with the Spirit of God directing you. Where is the Spirit taking you? The Spirit is taking you to advance the kingdom of God. Where is the wind blowing tonight? The wind is blowing in the direction of kingdom impact. The question is not whether or not the wind is blowing. The question is, will you surrender to the wind of the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do? My pastor recently said the Spirit leads us to being useful for the kingdom of God. I heard this quote on the way here from Pablo Picasso. Come on, Pablo Picasso. I just wanna keep saying that, Pablo Picasso. He said, the meaning of your life is to discover your gift and the purpose of your life is to give it away. Alarms are going off, I like this. Come on, it's better than ringtone earlier. That was, that was quite the ringtone. The meaning of your life is to discover your gift. The purpose of your life is to give it away. I wanna tell you tonight quite simply that God wants to do something through you that you have not even imagined yet. I'm telling you, now is the time. Tonight is a night where God is asking a generation to think bigger, 
to think broader, to realize that He can do more through your life than you could ever imagine if you would simply surrender to the wind, if you would simply reach out to God and say, I need your Holy Spirit. I cannot do this life without you. I cannot do this life in my own strength, but I need the Holy Spirit to be inside of me because this is the truth. There is a U-shaped solution to a problem that is out there. There is a problem that is out there in your families, in your circles, and the solution is you, but not just you, but you filled with the Holy Spirit. It is time to dream bigger. I wanna tell you that the same God, because we've been saying this, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes, right? So the same God that parted the Red Sea with a strong east wind, the same God that, that rose on the wings of the wind to rescue David. The same God that commanded the wind and the waves to be still and they were made still is the same God who tonight wants to blow in your life. The same God that wants to fill you. The same God that wants to take you into places and to realms that you would never dream of, but it begins with surrender. Would you guys stand to your feet tonight? If the band could come. I don't think it's a coincidence that a couple of days ago, I guess, it's, I guess it's just over a week ago now, my friend and I, 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 I this, is, this is something I love. I love that you guys come from a country and a continent where there are amazing animals, right? There are some pretty awesome animals in South Africa, I gotta say. I come also from a country originally, Australia, that has some awesome animals. A lot of times I'm convincing people that it's safe to come to Australia, it's okay. There's kangaroos, there's koalas, don't worry about the spiders, don't worry about the snakes. Well, oh, oh, I, get, I, had, a, I had a student in our youth ministry the other day showing me a photo of a spider that was the size of a three-story building. And it was like, no, but listen to me, it was the blurriest, most pixelated spider you'll ever see. And he's, in all sincerity, he's like, is this real, man? Like three stories high. And I'm like, bro, look at the picture, man. Like there is, that is a tarantula this big, okay, come on. But I love America. One of the things I love about America is that there are some pretty awesome animals in America as well. There are wolves, there are bears. I mean, America's pretty awesome. But the national emblem of America is an eagle. A Couple of days before I got on the plane to come here and minister, come here and be with you guys. I was walking with one of my good friends, his name's Neiman, he's the young adults pastor at our church. And we're walking and a lady stopped us. And the lady said, hey, 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 look at that tree over there. And so we turn and we look and of course, right there in the tree in front of us is a bald eagle. Now I've probably only seen about three or four of these in my life in the wild. And I love this moment with the Lord. I love this moment where I look and there's a bald eagle. And ever since I came to Johannesburg, ever since I've been in South Africa, I've just been thinking about, praying about, eagles, because I believe that God wants to commission you tonight to actually soar. I believe that God wants to commission you tonight. I believe that the Spirit of the Lord wants to take you to a new altitude tonight. Are you listening to me? Are you with me tonight? This is what I want you to know about the American bald eagle, that it actually rises above and soars above storms that there can be a storm that you are going through. And we've been talking a bit about storms. There can be a storm that you are going through that does not consume you because the Spirit of God lifts you above the storm. You see, when it comes to a storm, the eagle knows, the eagle senses that there is a storm coming. Does the eagle prepare to fight? Does the eagle prepare to use all of its strength, all of its might? No, it doesn't. Do you know what the eagle does? It spreads its wings. 
It spreads its wings and it catches the wind. It spreads its wings and it utilizes the wing, the wind. I love this because at the center of Christianity is a symbol and that is the cross. And Jesus, as he hung on the cross, what was he, do what was he doing? His arms were stretched wide. A posture of surrender. What does the eagle do? Oh, what does it say in Zechariah 4 verse 6? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The eagle does not push in its own might and its strength, but it surrenders and it soars. Because it surrenders, it soars. Because it surrenders, it soars. I love what the Scriptures say. I want to read two for you. Deuteronomy 32, 13, this is God's heart. He made him ride on the high places of the land. Isaiah 58, verse 14, I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. God wants to take us higher tonight. God wants you to rise up tonight. Would you close your eyes in this room? It comes through the Spirit of God. It comes through the Holy Spirit filling you up and empowering you. The Holy Spirit sending you forth. The Holy Spirit giving you strength. The Holy Spirit taking you to new horizons. Oh man, I speak that over you tonight. New horizons, new horizons, chasing the dawn, going further than you can ever imagine. My gosh, on the other side of you surrendering to the wind is you getting to the end of your life on earth and realizing that on the other end of your surrender was the satisfaction of completing and fulfilling the purpose of God over your life. The satisfaction of living for Him. I believe there's a few things that God wants to do tonight, but it's gonna start right here. Would you guys lift your hands if you're comfortable? It's gonna start right here with I believe God filling you with His Holy Spirit. I believe God doing something new in your life, doing something fresh in your life. I believe that God is gonna set a fire in the hearts of teenagers tonight. I believe that God is gonna give vision, give dreams to teenagers tonight. I just wanna read one more scripture and that's Acts chapter two, verse one. Acts chapter two, verse one. Earlier we were reading Acts chapter one, verse eight and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Be with me in this moment. The upper room, the day of Pentecost. Maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't. But it says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Every single one of them filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is what I wanna do tonight. I'm gonna pray of you and we're gonna go into worship. But as we go into worship, I wanna put this out there. If you're standing in this room tonight and you have never been baptized by the Holy Spirit, you have never been marked, you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, I believe tonight is a night where it's gonna, be, it's gonna happen. But would you be bold enough for those of you that I'm talking to, because the Bible talks about a baptism of the Holy Spirit and then it instructs in Ephesians that it would be a continuous thing, right? So you're not just filled once, but it says be being filled with the Holy Spirit. So I believe that God is gonna fill people with the Holy Spirit for the first time tonight, but He's also gonna refill some people. He's gonna fill all of us in this room with His Holy Spirit and He's gonna equip us. So this is what I wanna do. We've got an incredible ministry, ministry team. We've got incredible pastors. I'm gonna be down here as well. But if you have never been filled with the Holy Spirit, I wanna invite you to the front. It might, as we worship, it might be a new experience for you. And that's okay. 
the Holy Spirit is not weird. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is not a feeling. The Holy Spirit is a person that wants to fill you and change you. The Holy Spirit is a person that wants to go with you and equip you and strengthen you with absolutely everything that you need. But this is what I wanna say, the final thing that I wanna say. I love what happened at Pentecost because as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in other tongues. They begin to speak in other languages. And so tonight when you come forward and the team begins to pray for you, I, want, I, I don't want you to force it, but I believe that God wants to fill you. And I believe that some of you guys, as you surrender, as you open up your mouth, God is gonna equip you with a heavenly language. God is gonna equip you with a tongue that you have not had before. And I'm telling you, this is not weird. I was 17 years old. The first time a pastor got up on the stage and said, hey, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The first time a pastor said, Man, man, God is gonna fill you and give you the gift of tongues. I opened my mouth as a 17 year old. I did not even know what was happening. And out of nowhere came a heavenly language. Out of nowhere came an equipping that has helped me through every season of my life. So that's what I wanna say. When you come down and you're receiving prayer, open up your mouth with expectation that God is gonna fill you in Jesus' name. So one more time, would we all just lift our hands? Like I said, when we begin to worship, if that's you, come to this altar. But I wanna pray over us right now, a commissioning prayer right now. Father God, I thank You for every single person in this room. I thank You for every single teenager. I thank You for every single person with a beating heart in this room. Oh God, I just feel the weight of destiny that we were meant to be here in the here and now. We were meant to be here in this room. You have called every single one of us by name. And so God, you know exactly what needs to take place tonight. You, need, you know the chains that need to fall off. You know the equipping that needs to happen. I believe tonight that there's gonna be teenagers that receive gifts, teenagers that receive wisdom, teenagers that receive ability that they never had before in the mighty name of Jesus. So God, I just pray that you would hold nothing back in Jesus' name. God, I pray over a generation. I pray that there would be a fire set in the hearts of teenagers, a fire shut up in the bones of teenagers tonight, God. Light our hearts on fire. May hearts, may lives come alive tonight in Jesus' name. Would you wake up those that are asleep? Would you wake up those that are spiritually down and out? And God, God, would you fill us all with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, amen. Come on.